Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the primary healthcare webinar uh, series. Uh, our topic for today is uh, countries' primary healthcare system experiences, lesson from Uganda, Kenya, and uh, Ethiopia. Um, before I invite the moderator, it would be uh, important for us to introduce to you the International Institute for Primary Healthcare. The International Institute uh, for Primary Healthcare is established by the Ethiopian Ministry of Health. One of its engagement area is fostering knowledge exchange between countries and also packaging and designing different courses and delivering. We have received over 19 delegates uh, from over 20 countries since the establishment and we have provided different sets of trainings uh, and experience sharing visits. As part of our global uh, primary health care support, we organize a monthly webinar uh, series. I'm sure most of you have participated in the previous uh, webinar series as well. Uh, my name is Antana. I'm currently serving as the director of programs at the International Institute for Primary Health Care. Now, uh, allow me to invite and introduce Prof. Getinet Mutake. Uh, Prof. Getinet Mutake Kase is a medical doctor and holds an MPH and a PhD in public health. He is a senior researcher at the International Institute for Primary Healthcare with extensive experience in health research, teaching, and consultancy services, and holds a honorary adjunct professor position at Bardar University. He leads the implementation research section of the knowledge generation and management team with the strategic objective of enhancing capacity of implementation research for informing policy and program improvement of primary health care. His work focuses on identification of implementation gap, documentation of programs, generation synthesis, and sharing of evidence to inform primary health care systems. He disseminates evidence through publications such as issue or policy brief, workshops, page digest, peer-reviewed articles, books, and make consultation by holding dissemination workshops, seminars, meeting with policymakers, implementers, researchers, and think tank group. He collaborates with the Ministry of Health, non governmental organization, national universities, global partners, and research institution. Welcome, Prof. Kitanet. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antana. Um, hello, everyone um, attending this webinar uh, from also different time zones uh, over the globe. Uh, my name is Kitanet again. Uh, um, I think this is will, will be very exciting when not, where we bring three country experiences of primary health care together, Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting. And uh, this will be presented by experienced and uh, committed experts from these three countries who are actively engaged in primary health care activities, plans, uh, and also um, uh, uh, with, with different uh, experiences um, in teaching and other engagements. So the way we go as you've seen probably the agenda um, uh, uh, the, for, the, for each presentation, um, we allow 10 minutes uh, followed by you know, um, introductions for five minutes by the moderator. And then, uh, so we'll have all three presentations. Uh, after that, the Q and A um, session will start all uh, all questions. But you can still interact with the uh, Q and A um, um, box. So first, uh, we'll start with Dr. Mercy. Uh, 
uh, then for Dr. Innocent, we'll, we'll continue, and Mr. Van Dosen uh, will present the last presentation. So to start with uh, Dr. Mercy, uh, Dr. Mercy is uh, just a brief um, uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Mercy is a family physician and a primary care pro um, a provider, researcher, as well as advocate and leader. Uh, she, is, um, she is an awardee of uh, the Montegut um, uh, Global Scholars Program in 2022, uh, and also executive coordinator of the Africa Forum for Primary Health Care, one Karural Seeds um, Ambassador Africa region, and also executive member of the Wonka uh, Working Party, particularly rural accessing the education portfolio. She is also national secretary for the Kenya Association of Family Physicians and honorary chair Kenya Medical Association Imbu Division. Uh, she is a co-convener of the Ethics Standards Research CPD and Drug Policy Standing Committee of the Clinical Association. And she is also an independent consultant on global health and health systems strengthening, focusing on primary health care and primary care. She's passionate about promoting preventive and social, uh, social medicine uh, uh, as a whole, uh, and also social justice um, in, in healthcare in general. So welcome. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mercy, and you can uh, have the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Getnut. Uh, it's an honor to be here today to share the country experience from Kenya when it comes to primary um, health care. So in these 10 minutes, I chose to share lessons from the implementation of what we are calling the primary uh, care networks. Uh, so I'll start with a disclaimer that this is in no way representing um, all the knowledge when it comes to primary health care systems in Kenya or the landscape in the country. And information will keep changing. And also it does not represent directly the sentiments or the views of the Ministry of Health Kenya. So... And one of my favorite uh, quality improvement systems thinkers is uh, W. Edwards Deming, who said 94% of problems in business are systems driven and only 6% are people driven. And every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. So also as it follows, our primary healthcare systems are also designed to get the exact results that they're getting. So getting into a bit of the uh, background on the healthcare service delivery system in Kenya, we have a four-tier system that starts from the community level where we have community health services being led by what we're now calling the community health promoters. Uh, then from there, they're linked to primary healthcare facilities, which are known as our level two and three facilities. Level two facilities are our dispensaries. Level three facilities are health centers. Yes. Then from there, the, four, uh, the third tier is what we're calling the uh, primary and secondary referral tier, where we have what we call level four hospitals, formerly the district hospitals, and then the level five hospitals, which are now the county referral hospitals. Then from there, we move on to our level six, which is the tertiary referral tier, where we have all the national referral hospitals and centers. So that is just a snapshot of how the healthcare system in Kenya is organized. So of course, I'm going to focus on level one, two, three, and now four as well. So in terms of what our infrastructural landscape looks like in Kenya, our population density is about, uh, the facilities are, serve a, each facility serves a population density of about 2.2 per 100. Uh, we have 2.2 facilities per 100,000 population and approximately 13,727 primary care facilities. So 50% of these primary healthcare facilities are public health facilities. 37% private or for profit, and then 13% uh, private, not for profit. That is what we call the faith based organization facilities. And in terms of uh, where we are with health products and technology and basic equipment for our primary healthcare facilities, 
uh, we are at a coverage of 77% with basic equipment and only 24% have all the basic equipment currently. And in terms of availability of our essential medicines and drugs, they are at 44% coverage and dispensaries are only at about 37%. And uh, in terms of HRH, we are at 17 per 100,000. Yes. And this co-health workforce density represents all the people who serve at the primary health care team, including um, family, uh, family physicians, medical officers, yeah. clinical officers, nurses and nurse practitioners, yeah. all are, and also uh, all fall under this uh, co-health workforce density where we are at 17. So that is just a snapshot of what our infrastructure looks like currently. When we look at policy and the policy landscape and how it has developed over time, um, uh, in 2005, we had, uh, one uh, very huge milestone, which was the community level being included as part of the service delivery unit. And it was the first time that Kenya embarked on its journey towards um, creating and strengthening community health services. And uh, later on, a, uh, a couple of years actually passed before there was another milestone in terms of policy that supports primary health care in Kenya through the Kenya Medium Term Plan 2013-2017 that recognized the importance of primary health care um, facilities, primary health care systems and also the importance of things like the essential drugs list. And also another landmark or milestone that happened in 2013 was the devolution of healthcare services uh, from the national to the county governments in the spirit of localizing resources and also ensuring in 2030 also strengthened the issue around primary health care, primary health care facilities, supporting primary health care facilities as well. And in 2014, we had the development of the Kenya Health Sector Strategic and Investment Plan that also um, in, uh, enforced the same in terms of strengthening of primary health care, investing in primary health care, primary health care facilities, the issue of um, uh, th uh, things like um, free access to healthcare for mothers and 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 under fives uh, was also quite strengthened in this investment plan. Then in uh, 2014, the Kenya Community Health Strategy was developed for 2014-2019, which was also quite a landmark because it also strengthened uh, the issue of com that then called community health volunteers, their training, um, and also their equipping and how they deliver services at the community level. And here they were still called volunteers. And there was, there was no official framework um, for them to be professionalized or be given stipends yet. In 2020, this I would say was a landmark policy on uh, called the Kenya Primary Healthcare Strategic Framework that we are still implementing because this was a policy that focused specifically and only on primary healthcare. How do we strengthen primary healthcare? And you can realize it was during the COVID uh, pandemic and period where a lot of countries were realizing that having a strong primary healthcare system was really fundamental in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there was also the Kenya Community Health Policy that was developed at this time, 2020-2030, which we are still implementing, and then followed by the Kenya Community Health Strategy Renewal in uh, 2021. And now we have the Community, di community di Digitization Strategy, which basically talks about electronic community health information systems that is being implemented right now. There's a couple of about two to three counties that have started implementation, and we're looking to scale up in terms of electronic community health information system. So these are just the policies I've mentioned, and these are the guiding policies and documents that we're using currently as we are implementing what I talked about, the primary care networks. So what is a primary health care network? Um, this is a hub and spoke model where we have what I mentioned, the level four, the former district hospitals being a hub, uh, uh, offering comprehensive care services, and also having a multidisciplinary team that uh, offers the same, and uh, these uh, are designed to serve a population of about 100,000 with the spokes, which are the health centers designed to uh, serve about a population of 30,000. And these spokes, which are the health centers and the 
and the dispensaries are connected to the community level, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. At the community level, you have the community health units being connected to the link facility, which, is our, which are our spokes, and then moving on to the hubs. So the whole um, idea behind this is the issue of empanelment. How do you empanel and take care of a population throughout their life course and give them the best preventive and promotive care and also rehabilitative and curative services as close as possible to where they are? And the guiding document for this is the primary healthcare uh, network guidelines. Uh, developed in and uh, launched in May 2021 that guide how do you set up a primary healthcare network. So this network is supposed to do two things, both uh, empanelment at the population and service delivery level, and also financial empanelment as well. So the shift that uh, we're trying to make is from the current state, which is more curative and non-comprehensive with a lot of fragmented services where we have so many different programs. We have NCD program, HIV, TB, malaria program, so many different programs, and it's making very, it very hard to give effective care and services to the population. So we're trying to shift to a more preventive and promotive approach that is ensuring that the population is healthy and achieving population health. So for those who are sick, we ensure that they are taken care of and restore their health. And then for those who are not yet sick, we ensure that they remain healthy so that we can reduce the burden on the healthcare system when it comes to things like NCDs and other diseases. We also want to, to, uh, to take a comprehensive and integrative approach to services and also ensure the sustainable financing through uh, social health uh, insurance and um, uh, financial empanelment through capitation. So this is just a bit of a, a framework and explanation as to what the structure of a PCN would look like. So starting from the county level, we have the level one, two, three, connected to a level four hub. Then we have what we call a PHC coordinator in charge of the service and activities. Then we have a PCN coordinator whose job is specifically to um, set up the PCNs. And then we have the PCN management committee that manages a PCN fund. That fund is what we're talking about in terms of financial empanelment. So that fund is to cover that particular population that has already been empaneled by a primary care network. Of course, the services are delivered by a multidisciplinary team led by a family physician. This coming in an era where now Kenya is realizing the importance and the value that family physicians are adding to the primary care team in terms of providing clinical governance and leadership. And so this multidisciplinary team led by the family physician is in charge of the internal population and delivery of services to that population. So, so far, how has been our progress? It has been slow. Uh, so far, only 12 counties have been able to, to start the establishment process. At least one county, which is a success story, is Kisumu that has gone uh, full on with the process, established a, a, a fully functional uh, PCNs, and they're now scaling up. So we've, the process has mostly been donor or uh, partner supported with UNICEF and World Bank supporting a number of counties to start the establishment and AMREF as well. So I would encourage you once you get these slides, follow that link that says Kenya PHC advocacy videos. This is something that was doc documented by PHCPI, at least to have us have a video on lessons that were learned through the implementation of the primary health care strategy and uh, primary care networks in uh, Kisumu County specifically, and also the success of the community health services program as well there in reducing uh, things like maternal mortality, improving and improvement of service delivery. So what are some of the lessons um, learned through the process? So one of them is there's a huge policy implementation gap. The policies are there and they're good, but now when it comes to an implementation framework and how do you do it on the ground, there has been a struggle with most counties and also where I work in my county, there's a struggle of how does the implementation of establishing primary care networks, how do we go about it? And one of the things is funding, of course, because you've seen the ones who have been able to establish has been partner funded. So that means that the physical space in health right now does not have an allocation for the establishment of primary care networks. Um, then the other thing, um, the issue of how do you reimburse primary health care facilities so that it is sustainable over time and they can generate um, 
they can generate enough you know uh funds to enable uh them continue with their function so that is something that has not been clearly established yet and we are struggling with and then also the issue of there's no clear governance and coordination mechanism and also accountability structures so that has also been a challenge and all and i've already mentioned the issue of the financial landscape not uh supporting pcm so from my perspective and my view, what would be the recommendations like going forward from some of these lessons? Of course, we need vision and visionary for change management because primary health care, the primary health care system and concept in Kenya is not new. So we are not starting from nothing. So what we need to do actually right now is more of change management than anything else. Reorienting the system from what we mentioned that it's a curative disease-based system. We want to reorient it to want to produce population health. That is the end product and not just indicators that indicate the absence of disease or presence of disease. So we also need clear leadership, governance and accountability structures all the way um, that clearly state how the PCNs are run, how the PCNs are going, who, who the primary care network coordinators are answering to, who the PHC coordinators are answering to. So that structure is not there currently in the organogram and the official structures of most um, county governments. So that makes it very hard to coordinate the setting up of the PCNs as well. Um, then um, the other thing is it's about strengthening systems and re-engineering the system. What, what do I mean by re-engineering the system? This starts all the way from education, to service delivery because now we have a, a PCNs, we have a primary care approach. Are we teaching that in our schools? Then in terms of service delivery, do we now shift to know that we're supposed to do home visits, we're supposed to do more vaccination, more you know health education for the community, community empowerment. So that shift, I think would be very key in us moving forward. Yeah. And then finally, engagement and support of primary care providers is key. Because, for instance, uh, family physicians, family nurse practitioners, uh, uh, family medicine trained clinical officers, their discipline is literally primary health care and primary health care service delivery. So engagement of this particular um, that trained in primary health care would be quite important in how service delivery structure and also empanelment of populations is set up because at the end of the day, there are the implementers. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you. I hope I have not gone over time. I just want to leave you with one quote. Everything is theoretically impossible until it is done. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Prof. Gednet. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mercy. Mercy. Um, it was a very um, interesting uh, overview of the Kenyan primary health care system. And um, there are some questions. You can look at the, the Q&A uh, box and you can answer some of them in writing and the others can be discussed at a later stage. Now I will go to the next uh, presenter, Dr. Innocent. Um, Dr. Innocent is a family physician uh, and senior lecturer at the Department of Family Health at Makara University in Uganda, uh, Kampala. He is the current president of um, the African Forum for Primary Health Care um, and also executive committee member of the Primary Health Care and Family Medicine Network, which um, uh, includes 40, 40 universities uh, or academic institutions and 20 in 20 countries. And uh, these are all um, in uh, sub-Saharan countries. Um, he has published in primary health care and primary care. And uh, he is an assistant editor for the African Journal of Primary Health Care and Family Medicine. Uh, and he's also uh, uh, work, his research work focuses on PhD, PhD measurement and um, uh, strengthening of uh, primary health care um, uh, programs in general. Um, he is a PhD student uh, uh, in, in, in South Africa. Uh, now, um, the, um, over to you, Dr. Innocent, to save time. So um, I would encourage you to finish your presentations within 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, let me just share my presentation. So. 
Yeah, hello um, everyone. Um, as you have heard, I am Innocent Besige, uh, a family physician and a senior lecturer at the Makere University. And presently, I am the president for the African Forum for Primary Healthcare, uh, an Africa-wide uh, association that focuses on PHC advocacy. Uh, and here today, I will be um, talking about the country PHC system experience, uh, reflecting on the primary health care system in Uganda and what lessons um, we have learned. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation once again. And just to give uh, a highlight on what uh, Uganda is, Uganda is a low-income country uh, that is located in East Africa, actually neighbor to Kenya, where Masai is. Uh, and uh, its population is now estimated to be about 46 million people uh, with um, a doctor to patient ratio of one to 25,000 um, uh, to 25,000 people, which is far below what the WHO recommends. So um, our health system is a two tier system, which is basically a primary health care is under the district health system, uh, which is under the local government. And then the, the specialized services, excuse me a bit, I will just first take something off here. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, we also need to note that the private health providers play a key role in the primary health care, and these include the private practitioners and those providers who are not, who are private but not for profit. Just to make here in Uganda, we have um, uh, health as a part of every uh, public policy and for every action. And then in terms of empowerment of people and the communities with members that, that participate in the planning, the design and implementation of the PHC services. Of course, the challenge here we have first uh, is that we, we have uh, problems uh, with the, the raw literacy levels, which underscore the empowerment. We do that through provision of primary care services, and also to meet the population health needs. We do that through uh, public health. Uh, and here is where we link the facility-based primary care services with the public health functions, basically which are, are done through uh, outreaches like immunization, health education, and maternal and child health. And then our, our country tries to reorient uh, the PHC, the health system to primary health care. And this has been done uh, through health policy and health system strategic and investment plan these are government documents uh, which guide um, the implementation and investment uh, in health, and both of them are based on primary health care. And of course, we can't have primary health care without the workforce, and we have training for family physicians who, who are PhD specialists, and uh, several medical schools train family physicians as a key consultants for primary health care uh, systems. And then in terms of governance, uh, our PHC system governance is under the district health system as a way of, uh, 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 of implementing the decentralization strategy where key, decision, key health decisions are made at the district level, which is closer to where people live and work. And then you have the package, which is a, we call it the Uganda National Minimum and Health Care Package, which is a service of publicly funded uh, essential services that are accessible by every citizen. And then uh, looking at what we are doing, of course, we face several challenges in strengthening the PHC. And of course, among the challenges, there are low investment. 
uh, where it becomes somehow difficult to reach out um, to the population. For example, our commonest mode of, of transportation is the bicycle, uh, which is not, which may not be appropriate for some terrains and investment and 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 and. Uh, 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 and for some terrains in certain areas because of the of the hills and sometimes uh, rivers, and therefore reaching out to the people where they live and work is sometimes difficult. And our system is really still fragmented, with cities providing services uh, in a fragmented way, and this underscores the importance of continuity of primary health where services would be fitting into each other nicely with the continuity of care, which builds a trust between the providers uh, and, the, and the people served. The other problem is that um, our PHC system still focuses on vertical disease-oriented approaches with different, with focus on in, in primary care to some of the of diseases, particularly HIV, malaria, diabetes, as if these diseases occur, each occur in different individuals. But it's not unusual that one person will have all these problems. And therefore, we are trying to start with bringing integration in order to provide primary health. Finally, I want to mention that one of the key lessons that we have learned is that we need to be cognizant of natural disasters and the emerging epidemics. For example, the picture you see is of health facility, a primary health care facility in Western Uganda, which was washed away by a flood. And for several years, it has not been able to be rebuilt again. And that already underscores the, 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 the weak health system that is struggling to survive. And also take note of the re-emerging and emerging epidemics, particularly the COVID-19, which has affected everyone. And also the, the Ebola uh, epidemic, which is quite common here. And why I'm mentioning these epidemics is because when they happen, everyone forgets um, about the, uh, the essential PHC services and they focus on these epidemics. And as a result, what we have noted is that we, we, we always suffer increased mortality and the morbidity of, of, of other diseases because the focus of, the, of, of, of PHC is on these epidemics. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the noise in the background. I tried to talk, but I failed. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the next discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nelson, for your nice presentation and also finishing in time. So you can look at the, um, in, um, the QA box and see uh, whether there are any questions referring to you. Um, until um, the next uh, presentation is uh, completed. The next presenter is um, uh, Mr. Wandosen Nagatu. Uh, Wandosen is um, a public health professional by training. Uh, and um, he has very extensive experience for more than 18 years, um, starting from district level services. And now he's working at a national level. Currently, his position is head of community engagement and health extension services desk, which is under community engagement and primary health care lead executive office. He leads and coordinates um, the planning and implementation of HEP um, optimization, uh, which is health extension program, we call it HEP. And also he's involved in planning in review and also evaluation of the health extension program and uh, primary health care activities. He, he provides technical support to the regional health bureaus, um, uh, which are, um, uh, which are, uh, which is, um, uh, which has got their own uh, councils. And also he's passionate about the health extension pro program and primary health care. Now, the, the, um, over to you, Anderson. Thank you, Professor. I think the video is not working. So <clears throat> let me continue. Uh, as Professor uh, Gatinet introduced myself, uh, I am Anderson Gatu, working in the Ministry of Health, the Community Engagement and Primary Health Care Lead Executive. So I will be presenting very briefly the Ethiopian community health and primary health care experience. 
so these are the outlines for my presentation. Uh, I'll try to present my content uh, very quickly and briefly. Uh, as a background, the country background, uh, Ethiopia is a country which is situated in the Eastern uh, Africa with a population of more than 110 million. Uh, and the country is organized with 11 regional states and two city administrations. Uh, as you all know, it's a diverse uh, and with multi-ethnic uh, groups. And the primary health coverage of Ethiopia is uh, almost 100%. And we do have uh, different uh, facilities, uh, as you can see from here the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and the uh, Ethiopian health policy is uh, a pro-primary health care uh, policy, which uh, gives attention to the primary health care uh, and uh, focuses on the expanding the primary health care services. Uh, in, in line with this, uh, uh, health policy, the Japan health policy outlines the democratization and the centralization of the health system, development of promotive and pro uh, promotive components of uh, the health service. It also, the policy also ensures accessibility of health care by uh, to all population, uh, promote intersectoral collaboration and in involvement of uh, private sectors. Uh, and promote and enhance national self-reliance in health development by mobilizing uh, and efficiently utilizing the internal and external resources. This is the uh, uh, background, the outlines of our health policy. Uh, and the, the health service delivery arrangement of Ethiopia is structured into a three-tier system. So the three type systems are primary, primary level health care, secondary level health care, and tertiary level health care. The primary level health care is co uh, composed of the health posters, health center, and primary hospital. In general, this the primary level health care is expected to provide uh, service to 100,000 population. So a health post is uh, one of the component of the primary health care, but the primary level health care and the operational center for the health extension workers. And the health post is uh, mainly constructed in rural part of the country uh, and expected to provide service uh, for 3,000 to 500 people. And uh, when we come to the health center, a health center, uh, rural health center is expected to provide uh, maximum to 25,000 people. And in urban areas, health centers are expected to provide uh, to 40,000 people. So let's come to the brand of Ethiopia, and, uh, which is the health extension program. So it is health extension program is a defined package of uh, basic and essential promotive, preventive and basic uh, curative health services. And it mainly targets Households, uh, which is, uh, as you all know, uh, with the most innovative uh, community based uh, head scheme of uh, the country. And it is uh, the philosophy of the extension program is if uh, the right knowledge and skills is transferred to households, they can take their responsibility for producing and maintaining their own health. So, this health extension program entirely uh, engage the community to produce uh, their health. So when you see the need for health extension program in Ethiopia is due to a high burden of communicable diseases, uh, the health extension program is designed to alleviate the burden of communicable diseases. And there is also limited utilization of health care services. So <laughs> to increase the health seeking behavior of the community, uh, health extension program has a key role and the other, the weak community involvement in health uh, is also a prominent uh, problem. So to alleviate also this, the community involvement problem, health extension program is uh, an ideal platform to engage the community uh, very well. And the need for high level hygiene and sanitation demanding is also one of the most important points to establish the health extension program. 
So the main uh, goal of the health extension program is to create a healthy society and reduce the rates of maternal and child morbidity and mortality. Uh, as I said earlier, the health extension program is expected to provide equitable, promotive, preventive, and basic curative services to the communities. So when we see the approach of the health extension program implementation, uh, it's <clears throat> basically uh, focus on households. So the health extension workers regularly visit the community and provide health information that they promote health and they also disseminate different messages that help the community to prevent the diseases and the other uh, approach of uh, <clears throat> implementing health extension program is community-based or outreach services. These are mainly uh, providing health information to the community, especially in public uh, gatherings. And the other is the health post-based activities. As I said earlier, the health post is the operation center for the health extension workers. So in the health, uh, health post, the uh, health extension workers provide different uh, services, promotive, preventive, and some curative service to the community. And they also address uh, different uh, platforms, especially uh, to address the youth groups, uh, school users and out of school users. So they usually work at the youth centers and the schools to uh, address the users. And the implementation strategy, uh, it's already said, it focuses on household and community, improve the community participation or engagement, and the other thing is strengthen the linkage between health post and health center. The other thing uh, is intersectoral collaboration and partnership, and the continuous in-service uh, training and professional development is one of the implementation strategy for the health extension program. So primary health care and health extension program, when you say, as you know, primary health care is defined as, uh, this is a WHO definition, a whole of society approach to health that aims to maximize the level and distribution of health and well-being through the components of primary health care and essential public health function, multi-sectoral policy action and empowered people and community. So this is, uh, everybody knows that it is a primary health care definition. So the Ethiopian primary health care level has three kinds of services already mentioned in the health entire system, health posts, health center, and primary hospitals. Health posts are staffed with two uh, extension workers and are responsible for a population of three to, three to 5,000 people. And health center uh, also uh, in rural se setup will provide service to 25,000 people and for urban, in urban cases, for 40,000 and primary hospital provides inpatient, inpatient and ambulatory service to an average population of uh, 100,000 population. These health posters, health center and primary hospital makes the primary health care units in Ethiopia. So the health centers are the immediate supervisors or and responsible for to support the health extension program both uh, administratively and technically, and uh, primary hospitals also serve as a referral center for the health centers and mentorship, mentorship and training sites for the health workers who are working at the uh, health center level. So uh, having said this, currently we are working to optimize the health extension program. The health extension program served uh, in this country for the last uh, 17 years. So to provide a quality of health service for the community and to address the needs, the current needs of the community, uh, we have designed, we have developed a 15 years health extension program optimization roadmap. So to accelerate the realization of uh, universal health coverage, health coverage through the health extension program, we have uh, designed the the extension program optimization. So why do we need the, why do we optimize the health extension program? There is a sub-optimal delivery and utilization of health services, especially the access and uh, the quality. This is one of the problems that push us to develop the uh, roadmap. And there is a high need from the community 
uh, in relation to the change of demography, epidemiology, and other technological advancements. So this is also one of the factors that urges us to review the health extension program and produce develop a roadmap. And the other, uh, the third one is disruption of the health extension program due to emergency and outbreak. These are the critical issues that urges us to develop the at the roadmap. So in our uh, roadmap, we are we have uh, six uh, strategic objectives that that will uh, help us to increase the utilization of primary care and achieve the universal health coverage. So these six uh, strategic objectives are the main objectives for the uh, roadmap. Uh, when we see the primary health care and community engagement, let me focus on uh, some parts of this. Uh, till 1990s, we had different uh, community engagement platforms, like the community health agents, CBRHs, malaria agent, and the TVs. These were the community engagement strat uh, strategies that was working during this time. And later, uh, the introduction of the health extension program. Health extension was Health extension program was introduced uh, in 2003. So around 2010, uh, the Minister of Health introduced the so-called uh, community engagement platform, Women Development Group. So I'll uh, come to the details of this uh, later. And then in 2016, competency-based training for Women Development Group uh, was launched and uh, started. And then. <clears throat> Uh, as part of the health extension program optimization in 2029, uh, the new community engagement strategy was uh, designed and currently we are also uh, trying to implement in some of the world that's in the country. And I'll come to later to this also. As you all know, community engagement is a process. Uh, in which community are engaged and participated in making decisions about their own health. And the community are expected to participate uh, from uh, in identifying the health needs of the community and in planning, organizing, and the like. Uh, women Development Group is an approach uh, and systematically organized uh, movement of neighboring households. So, this is a new initiative and networking to expand the best practices in health within a short period uh, to reach the entire community. And this will enable the community to produce and sustain their own health through implementing the health extension program package. So the development group, we call it, uh, there are two platforms, one to search and one to five networking. These are the two uh, main structures. So at Kabali level, a team of 20 to 30 households form the development group. And each development group consists of uh, four to five, one to five networks in it. And this network work together, uh, discuss the health issues together in their uh, villages and uh, share their experiences to their neighborhoods. And the uh, CBT training, uh, the WDA leaders, the Women Development Group leaders are expected to take uh, training for 52 hours, which uh, probably take two and a half months. So on daily basis, they are expected to take two to three hours and uh, all these 52 hours uh, are expected to be finalized within uh, two months. And this, with a uh, close support from the health extension workers, this development uh, group are expected to conduct uh, their regular meetings and their main agenda is the implementation of the health extension program package. They also identify the bottlenecks on utilization of their services and implementing the packages. Uh, and also they're expected to fill the gaps on the basis of uh, findings of their uh, discussion. This is uh, a redesigned community engagement strategy. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, the PHSU, the so-called the health center is already there and the under 
the health center. At each health post, there are health extension workers. And under, under there, the health extension workers, this is the new uh, platform we introduced since 2021. So these village leaders are expected to oversee uh, three to four uh, women development groups in their catchment. So this is the new one. So when we uh, redesign this community engagement strategy, there are components like the first one is uh, uh, optimizing the women development groups. And the, other, the second one is engaging main development groups. These are in our context, basically this closely work with the agricultural sector. So <clears throat> we should also engage them to work the, to the health sector. So the main development groups will be engaged and the use school use and out of school uses and the other social structures, indigenous structures. There are uh, several indigenous structures in our uh, situation like uh, religious institutions, clan leaders, uh, etc. So uh, these are the, the newly designed community engagement strategy, so which mainly focuses on these platforms and uh, the other component is uh, introduction of sustained motivation scheme. So we are currently uh, trying to scale up this uh, newly designed uh, community engagement strategy about in 30 or less currently and last year in 2015 in an Ethiopian calendar, we also try to uh, scale it up to 50 uh, additional waradas. So this is currently what we're working. So what are the key achievements in implementing the health extension program as well as the community engagement? Uh, there is significant reduction of maternal and child morbidity and mortality, uh, reduction of morbidity and mortality due to major communicable diseases like TB, malaria, and uh, HIV. This is uh, some of the achievements that we uh, get from the implementation of the health extension program and engaging the community. And the community's demand to the healthcare service is increased through the continuous uh, health promotion that is done by the health extension workers. The health system literacy as well as health seeking behavior of the community is uh, improved. And the maternal, neonatal, and child health service coverage is also uh, increased. So, <clears throat> as a result of the major contribution of the health extension program into the broader health system, morbidity and mortality rates are decreased. The other uh, achievement is uh, major reforms at the PHC level. There are different reforms at the PHC level, like the PHCG, uh, primary healthcare clinical line. This helps us to standardize and provide quality of clinical care at the health centers. And the health center reform implementation guideline, this also ensure the provision of quality of clinical care as well as standard uh, management of health care clinical auditing and uh, primary health care alliance for quality. This is the networking of primary health care facilities to share a reformulated experience among the health facilities. So the other achievement, uh, uh, Ethiopia is uh, achieving uh, the goal of uh, the goal of unrestricted access to care by building health posters. And currently we have about more than uh, 17,000 health posters in the country and more than 40,000 health exchange workers across the country. Uh, in doing all these things, there are challenges. Among some of the challenges that we are facing is there is lack of uniformity in the implementation of health extension program and the community engagement platform, the so-called women development group across uh, the country. There is also attrition of uh, health extension workers, interruption of supplies and health commodities, weak referral linkage between health post and health center, and also low coverage of uh, model families. These are some of the challenges. The other is, uh, as I said, in the newly uh, redesigned community engagement strategy, we are trying to engage the main youth and other indigenous institutions. Uh, so far, we had uh, uh, a limitation in engaging main youth uh, as well as other indigenous structures. 
So that was uh, also one of uh, the challenges and shortage of drug and other medical supplies is also uh, the challenge. I think this is uh, all what I want to present to you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Wendelson, for, for your elaborated presentation. Although you have taken uh, more time, I think um, uh, you have presented um, some of uh, the details and thank you very much. Now, um, uh, I'm sure um, you have seen um, some of the questions in the chat box. Some are common to all and some are um, uh, maybe specific to each country um, experience. Uh, we can uh, start uh, from those uh, questions. Uh, maybe with, um, uh, with um, to start with Dr. Mercy, uh, if you haven't um, answered some of the questions, really there were uh, so many interesting questions to know about more about Kenya's um, uh, primary healthcare program. Uh, maybe you can tell us more about the strategies that you are using to overcome the health workforce shortage um, in uh, in primary health care, how you are um, uh, producing um, those you know needed needed uh, health workers um, uh, for primary health care, including you can address also, which is common to uh, both Uganda and Kenya, how you are using um, uh, the family physician, um, how they fit into the primary health care program, and at what level they are um, they are um, uh, used to improve the primary health care uh, services. Let's start with this and then we'll go to other questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Getnut. I think I'll start with the issue of the human resource. The very uh, various strategies that um, the government has been employing in terms of trying to in, uh, solve the human resource shortage. So as you know, the only two ways you can do this is either you reduce the population or increase the healthcare workers. But since you cannot reduce the population and right now the increasing of healthcare workers, there's not enough uh, physical space for that. Um, one thing they did is uh, training of um, 47 family physicians in Cuba so as, as, as to increase the primary health, uh, health workforce. And like I mentioned, the family physician is key in providing clinical governance and leadership. Because the way I look at uh, primary health care um, based on the 80-20 principle is that at first contact, uh, the population should be able to find a healthcare worker who can handle at least 80% of their problems. So if you have that kind of a setup, then you'll have like, um, this also addressing a question someone had asked on the issue of bypassing. People bypass because they are seeking specialist services or they are seeking services or the opinion of a specialist that is not found at the primary healthcare level. So by bringing family physicians who are specialists at the primary healthcare level, you've actually taken care of that problem. So there's no bypassing. You have someone who can provide clinical office oversight, leadership, governance, ensuring there is um, quality improvement of care, uh, quality delivery of services, ensuring that the, the patients who are seen at the primary health care level go to the correct and right place because you know one of the reasons why we have such a small physical space in health is because of waste and if the right uh, patient uh, the right healthcare worker sees the right patient at the right time then that reduces that waste as well so in kenya the primary uh, the family physician has been placed at tier 4 and tier 4 is the district health uh, former district health um, hospital, which is now called either a sub-county health facility or a level four health facility. So from there, they lead what is called a multidisciplinary team. And that team is in charge of the care of the empaneled population from the connected level two, three and level uh, level two, three facilities and level one, which is the community um, level. So I hope I've been able to answer those questions. Thank you very much. That's Yeah, thank you. And also the other way is uh, the utilization of community health promoters, as we call them now, uh, to improve the health promotion and health education component, and also provide, you know, basic um, ailment treatment and uh, services at the community healthcare level as well. Thank you, Prof. Getnet. Back to you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, um, it's uh, it shows that we are at a different level as well. Um, also, I have seen also you have a, a community health um, uh, community health services at the bottom, and also have a primary health care primary health care services a little away a bit up. So, is there any difference between these two? Before I go to Doctor Innocent. Um, so ideally, community health services and primary health care services should be, you know, one entity, because the whole idea around primary health care services is to ensure that there's community involvement. Actually, it is in the definition of primary health care and is fundamental to what family medicine stands for and primary care training stands for. So ideally, they should be one. But in the case of how the structural implementation and also the physical implementation is being done in Kenya, right now they are being considered to separate level. So the community health level is where we have people um, about um, 10 villages forming uh, one community health unit. And then about uh, each community health unit is led by a community health promoter. So the idea behind community health services is to take down services like health promotion, health education into the community, and they have to be acceptable to the community. That's the representation by a community health promoter who is selected by the community. Then uh, now these community health services provided by the community health promoters and also given oversight by someone who is a professional called a community health assistant trained in community health service prov uh, provision. They now connect these communities and their needs, and, um, their challenges, problems to what we call a link facility. So they now provide a link between facility-based um, healthcare services and community-based healthcare services. That's why there's a distinction in the tiers, level one and level two, three. Back to you, Prof. Getnet. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mercy. Uh, now I, I, I go to, um, I'd like to go to, Dr. Innocent, you can reflect on the, you know, on the issue of family physician. Uh, and also when Dawson, uh, we have a similar program, the family physician. Uh, you can reflect on that, how Ethiopia is trying to approach this. And another cross-cutting issue maybe uh, in addition to that is uh, in all the three presentations, uh, it was uh, also, it was in, in the chat box, the shortage of supplies was a major issue and how these are dealt with um, uh, in the different countries we can, uh, you can, you can uh, talk about. And the other uh, second question, which are also cross-cutting cross are decentralization. How much the decentralization um, is facilitating or maybe with regards to uh, you know, decentralizing finance and other administrative issues versus also uh, the checks and balance uh, and other uh, things related to that can be also discussed. Uh, please, um, Dr. Innocent. Yeah, thank you um, very much, Prof. Um, of course, there are several other questions, but I will first reflect on the family physicians. Uh, uh, it's, uh, of course, there is still a challenge that family physicians are new on the African continent. And they are also in many countries, there are no training programs. Even where training programs are, there is still confusion on what the actual role of the family physicians is. Uh, but I think the most important and critical issue is to appreciate that family physicians are trained to provide generalist care, where the person is still looked at as the whole, as the person, the person, as an individual who has health needs, who lives in a family that also who, that also determine which needs are likely to arise, but also as a member of the community. So, uh, so in terms of defining the roles of the family physicians, of course, given the unique challenges we have in in, in Sub-Saharan Africa mainly, most family physicians are providing clinical services. Uh, also, uh, where they, they lead primary health care teams in the provision of primary care services. What we also need to appreciate is that family physician uh, training and practice is contextual, and sometimes the, the, the training curriculum is designed according to the needs of that particular location. 
Now, um, reflecting on the issue of finances, particularly for PHC and the, uh, and in terms of logistics, for example, on the uh, on the regular stockouts of essential medicines and the, and and the, and the medical supplies, it's quite common. Uh, and this uh, is answered by what we are trying to do in the promotion of decentralization. Because when we decentralize, it means that the community members participate in the planning, design, and implementation of the PHC services. And therefore, uh, when there is a decentralization, it is the P which is under the, the citywardship of the districts or the local governments. They are the people who know what are the common diseases that exist in their particular locality. They are the ones who, therefore, it will determine on which medicines that, that, that they need to be ordered. Unfortunately, the medicines are, are, are ordered and supplied by the national body, which is charged with the supply of those drugs and medical and medical uh, and medical supplies. And sometimes the, 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 the district will make an order, and then they, you find that at the national stores it is not there. But the, the decentralization helps to specifically order for what they need. But also uh, to answer why how decentralization is important. In, in, in uh, providing services to remote areas. Again, the, 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 the people in the remote areas, they are the ones who know their particular issues. For example, in Uganda here, we have some districts uh, which are in, within Lake Victoria. For example, the district which is composed of 84 islands within the Lake Victoria. And sometimes there are challenges. You cannot know where, how, how, you can, how to provide the services to such people, particularly PHC. So when you have the local people deciding on how to design and implement the, the PHC system, it will be much more uh, it will be more, much more understood by them than somebody sitting at the Ministry of Health if there was no decentralization um, to make uh, such a decision. And um, so I also want to mention Mr. Moderator uh, on the issue of epidemics and natural disasters, because I think it was also a question in the Q&A. And I think the, the epidemics, particularly for COVID-19 and for, particularly for Uganda, the Ebola, which is also a common epidemic here. I think when a, a weak PHC system is faced with such epidemics, it actually worsens and it underscores all of the efforts that are being put in the press make it stronger. For example, what you noticed when there were uh, quarantines and lockdowns, the lockdowns did not cater for the, the, the did not cater for the health providers' movements. And for two weeks, there was the patients who managed to go to hospital would not actually find any health worker because the health workers were so under lockdown and they could not move. And it it, get, it got us thinking that probably in order to make the system resilient. There is a need to provide uh, accommodation for the health workforce near the hospitals. And I think we need to start to be thinking on how to prepare for these epidemics and, and, and the natural disasters. Um, finally, I want to answer one question uh, which was also asked on the challenges of establishing PHE systems in low and middle income countries, particularly in East Africa. And I think what all of us need to appreciate is that PHC is complex and therefore dealing with complex situations need a lot of understanding of the multiple pathways that result into a, a particular outcome. And particularly here in Africa, in, 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 in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa in particular, most of us health services are still donor funded. And I think that becomes a problem because our governments are putting less money. And when they put, they put less money generally for health and even much less for primary health care. So there is a need to make a case for PHC so that much funding is actually put into PHC that would make PHC establishment much better because there will be enough money. But the, donor, the donors commonly they focus on vertical disease programs. For example, much of the donor money goes to HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Yet we know that if we, add, if we had quality PHC that is well-funded, even the treatment outcomes 
all the management outcomes for HIV, uh, for, for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria would be much better. So we still have a complex problem of establishing a PHC. And again, people think that the PHC is equal to cheap health, but which is not the case. In any case, PHC needs much more money than the specialized services. So we need a critical mass of people who, have, who can start the conversation and make a case for PHC. And if that happens, then probably we shall, we shall find it easier to establish PHC systems in East Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Innocent, uh, for answering questions um, uh, I raised and also um, uh, looking at the, 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 the QA box. Um, maybe I, I can go to Wendosen, um, Mr. Wendosen. Uh, you, you can talk about, you know, um, there are questions related to the plan, plan, um, your plan to revitalize health posters. Most of them are now in poor conditions. And uh, uh, what does the, the new community engagement plan um, um, provide to infrastructure at community level? We can start to, with that, and then you can answer questions that are uh, forwarded. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> Let me try to address some of the questions. I've uh, looked at also the Q&A boxes, and I'll, to, I'll try to address some of the questions. So first, uh, regarding the health post revitalization, uh, for the interest of time, I didn't mention the detailed health uh, optimization roadmap. So in this roadmap, uh, we currently uh, <clears throat> categorize the existing health posters in uh, three different uh, health posters as per the guidance from the roadmap. So the health posters are categorized into uh, main three categories. The first one is health post, which is situated far from the supervising health center. We call it comprehensive health, uh, health post. And this comprehensive health post is expected to provide a comprehensive health services to the community. So uh, in terms of infrastructure, yes, it's right. The existing, almost all, more than 90% of the existing health posters are uh, constructed 17 years back. And most of them are constructed from locally available materials, mud and wood. And most of them are uh, need to be demolished and uh, reconstructed. So. The uh, comprehensive health post design is totally different from the existing ones. So it is uh, huge uh, when we compare to the existing, and it uh, is expected to uh, provide different services, both the promotion, this prevention, as well as the treatment of uh, some adulthood illnesses. So the, <coughs> there is a new comprehensive health post design, which is uh, uh, prepared for as per the roadmap. And in this comprehensive health post, different health profit, there will be a professional mix. In addition to the health extension worker, there will be a health officer or family health professional, uh, midwife, environmental, laboratory, pharmacy professionals. So, and it's expected to provide uh, some of the services which are given at health center but not all of the services. All the, the services which are uh, supposed to be provided at a comprehensive health post are uh, taken from the revised essential health service package. So this is one of the health posts. And the other uh, health post is the basic health post, which is a health post, which is near to the health center, uh, probably within uh, one hour walking distance. So this sales post is expected to provide basic services, especially focusing on the 18 packages of the health extension program. And in relation to the human resource, uh, in this basic health post, there will be an additional nurse in addition to the uh, health extension workers. So most of uh, the services uh, provided at the basic health posts are mainly focusing on the HIP package and the other one, uh, a health post which is found near to a health center or primary hospital. Uh, in some cases, you might find uh, a neighboring good health post and health center. So this 
the very near nearest health post or the neighbor for the health center will be merged to the uh, existing so for the supervising health center and the services will be integrated to the uh, health center so uh, we are not expected to construct another health post in such cases so basically after categorizing the existing health posts in such a way finally we will be having two kinds of uh, health posts the basic and the comprehensive one currently uh, we have uh, about 48 comprehensive health posts which have started providing the service uh, in different regions of the country and with the commitment of the community and the government there are about 76 uh, comprehensive health posts under construction as per the new uh, design so the health posts design is uh, revised and the standard is also revised uh, we have two kinds of health posts finally the basic and comprehensive one so the quality of existing health posts is uh, uh, under critical condition, then it needs to be uh, revitalized. So the roadmap guides us to revitalize, renovate the health posters. So we are working on that, but uh, it needs a huge resource. We are trying to mobilize from the different uh, community members, the partner organizations, and the government to renovate the health posters. So it needs the commitment of the government, partner organizations, and the community as well to implement the roadmap as per the uh, design. The other thing, the scale up of uh, the new community engagement strategy, it was uh, piloted in four ORADAS in 2021, and we have tried to scale it up to 30 ORADAS, which is additional 26 in 2014 Ethiopian fiscal year. And last year, uh, which is uh, 2015 in our calendar, uh, we, are, we were trying to address additional 50 orders. So we do have about more, more than 1,100 uh, rural orders. So when we could compare the uh, orders which are implementing the redesign community engagement strategy and the number of orders we have, still it is very low. Uh, and we are trying to uh, reach out uh, every Worada, and we are, we are working hardly to mobilize the resource. It also needs a resource because we need to train the VHLs and optimize the uh, WD. We all we should also pro provide training uh, for the YOS groups and the other platforms. So it also needs a resource and commitment of the local uh, government and the health sector. So still we are trying to uh, uh, reach out most of the workers. So for the coming year, we have also planned uh, about 90 workers to scale up the implementation of this redesigned community engagement strategy. Uh, thank you. Thank from you the Q&A box uh, that I have seen some of the questions, it's obvious health exchange workers are available with other uh, workers. So. Uh, a direction is uh, given to regional health bureaus to avoid additional or non-health sector activities for the health extension workers. And we are trying to uh, uh, closely follow this while we are doing the supervisions and support us. I have to stop you here. Uh, sorry. sorry. About, I have to stop you here. Uh, we have got around five uh, minutes. Five minutes. Uh, so I will give you another chance. You can complete uh, another round. So just in two minutes, one and a half minutes, uh, for three of you, um, you can address some of the questions that are not addressed. And also questions, very quick questions. One is, are community health workers paid in Kenya? Um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, uh, you can talk about, uh, uh, or about the PHC re-engineering, um, uh, that uh, you raised during the, the Dr. Mercy, you raised during your presentation. And also three of you can reflect on the policy implementation gap in, uh, in, our, in the three countries. So this is, this is just for quick reflection. 
uh, in the next five minutes. So let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Mercy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Getnet. I think I'll start um, with the question on whether community health volunteers, whom we are now calling community health promoters, are um, paid. They are not yet professionalized, so they are not paid a salary. But what uh, the government is embarking on is paying them a stipend um, per month and also paying their healthcare insurance. And whenever they do activities, they're supposed to be reimbursed in terms of transport or time taken or um, given lunch for the day. So as of now, they're not receiving like a salary because they're not a professionalized cadre yet. Uh, moving on to the issue of um, health systems reengineering, a system um, is just a, a sum of parts and those parts connect in a particular way. And the healthcare system is what we call the best example of a complex adaptive system. So that means that one, like Dr. Innocent mentioned, it's complex. So how do you take these complex parts? How do you undo them? And then how do you reconnect them in a way that it delivers you what you want? That is what systems reengineering is about. Looking at primary health care, we need to ask ourselves, what do we want our primary health care system to do? In my opinion, what you want from a primary health care system is one simple thing, population health. You want to have as many healthy people as possible and as few sick people as possible. You'll always have sick people, but can we have the sick people who we cannot keep healthy? going into the system so that they go into curative, rehabilitative. Because what right now we have is a system that is overburdened by sick people. That's why we cannot finance it. We cannot have enough um, medicine for it because we cannot have enough in terms of curing diseases. So systems reengineering for primary healthcare system should focus on one, creating a system that produces population health, two, Connecting the different sum of the parts, that is the health, um, health resources, uh, health uh, human uh, resources component, HPT component, infrastructural component, and connecting them in such a way that they give you that. So what example can I give of this? One, I've mentioned the issue of the first person you come into contact with in the primary healthcare system should be able to take care of 80% of your problems. That's number one. And that means you have to take care of the whole range of primary health care services and also service provision. That starts from all uh, preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, the issue of health and education and community engagement. So that has to happen at the primary health care level for your primary health care level to deliver for you what you want at the end of it. So the system's reorientation and um, reengineering is about that because as we have it right now, it's the opposite. The pyramid, the health pyramid, as I say it, is upside down. The first contact you meet at the primary healthcare level can only take, a, take care of maybe 1% of your needs. What does that mean? You have to go all the way to a referral facility for you to get the healthcare that you need. That's the issue of bypassing. That's the issue of delayed diagnosis and treatment. So all those things can be solved if you engineer, if you orient your pyramids such that 80% of your problems are being taken care of the primary healthcare level. And those that leak can now go into the tertiary level for, for care. But that is the whole concept of that. I don't know if uh, was there another question for Getnet I was supposed to answer. I think I've answered the two major ones. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Dr. Innocent, um, any quick reflections? Okay, Dr. Innocent. Um, Maybe if you if you are not hearing me, I think he might have. Yeah, maybe a connection problem. When Dosan, you you can go ahead if you have really a couple of things to say within one minute. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, as you <coughs> uh, read the question, there is all the, as you said, there is a false implementation gap. That's why we are trying to work. Uh, the uh, needs of the primary health care services to the community. So, uh, the, as I said earlier in my presentation, the Ethiopian health policy is uh, uh, more focuses on the primary health care, but the existing primary health care uh, service has its own limitations. So, I think uh, we have to work hard to address the uh, implementation gaps. That's what I want to add on this uh, thing. 
the other thing regarding the there was a question which I looked at from the Q and A box uh, the, regarding capacity of health exchange workers or the competency of health exchange workers to <clears throat> uh, to build the capacity of health exchange workers. Uh, we are implementing the so-called IRT in service, uh, a kind of in-service training, uh, integrated refresher training. So uh, regularly, every two years, it's expected to be provided for those health exchange workers. For instance, uh, within the last two years, we have provided on uh, RMNSH and the CVC modules for all the health exchange workers. And currently, we are also trying to provide and the, the training on uh, non-communicable and, uh, and major communicable diseases. So we already uh, develop and revise the modules and uh, the remaining thing is mobilizing the resource for this training. And we're also trying to introduce a blended learning approach for the health exchange workers, both face-to-face -face and the digital learning. So uh, it also needs a resource because it needs a tablet for the digital learning. So if we are able to deploy all these uh, things, we can address the capacity gaps of the uh, health extension workers. And the other uh, question that I saw is the uh, progress of functioning of pages in Ethiopia with a wide range of conflict affected area. Uh, of course, it's known. During the conflict, there was a problem in providing the care at, the, at these primary health care uh, facilities. Uh, but in areas where the war is uh, <coughs> uh, stopped, we are trying to uh, revitalize the primary health care system in that uh, specific area. And still we are, especially in, the, in some of the areas which, are, which were affected by the uh, war, we are trying to resume uh, the services and we are, trying, we are also trying to uh, restore the services. Of course, there, there are still remaining uh, issues we didn't totally address all the required uh, services at this uh, uh, war affected areas and it also needs our attention as well as other uh, partners attention uh, the supply issue it's already uh, i have also mentioned as a challenge uh, still there are many primary health care facilities who needs uh, supplies for uh, to provide the required services Still, this is uh, the remaining challenge that we are facing in the primary care system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. These were really wonderful presentations. I, I, I thank all the three presenters, Dr. Mercy, Dr. Innocent, and Mr. Wendosen. Uh, very nice presentations. We learned a lot. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank the participants. Uh, for your wonderful questions, insightful questions that uh, we have tried uh, to um, they have tried to uh, answer those questions, but some may be left out uh, because we don't have time. But otherwise, we have tried to address uh, most of the questions. And I would like to, uh, at the end, also I'd like to um, acknowledge the organizers of this webinar. And thank you very much. Have a nice day from I, my end. So over to you, uh, organizers. Good night also for some of you.